Um, I want to read down through verse 19. Let's follow along. Matthew 11, 1 through 19. After Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in the towns of Galilee. When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? And Jesus replied, Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. As John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out in the wilderness to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. Then what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. Truly I tell you, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been subjected to violence, and violent people have been raiding it. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you're willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who was to come. Whoever has ears, let him hear. What can I compare this generation? They're like children sitting in the marketplace and calling out to others. We played the pipe for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking. They say he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Here's a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right by her deeds. We're going to be looking at Jesus and John the Baptist, and in order to do that, there will be four sections here that I want to look at. John hears about the deeds of Messiah. And, and in, response in response to what those, what those individuals want to know about Jesus, about Jesus, Jesus shares his own, his own understanding of his ministry. And Jesus, and Jesus will then speak, speak about John. And, and then he's going, then he's going to ask the question, what is, what is this generation like? John, John hears about the, about the deeds of the Messiah. Of Messiah. Notice, Notice we, we, uh, uh, I think there's I think five, five, five times in the Gospel, in the Gospel Matthew. 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 Where it, says, where it says, after, after Jesus, Jesus said, these said these things, uh, he, uh, then, he goes then goes on, on from there. there. And, a lot, and people, a lot of people think those are significant, significant visions, visions in the Gospel, the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew and they certainly, certainly come, come after sections, sections of teaching. teaching. Uh, Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter, chapter 10, 10 is a significant, significant section, section of teaching, of teaching on Jesus. Jesus. And notice, and notice um, in this particular in this verse that it that says, says Jesus, Jesus went from there and there to teach, teach and preach the good news, news in the town of Galilee. Galilee. And as he and did, as he did so, so, we think, we of, think of a couple of different of things related, related to teaching and preaching. And preaching. And I, I think I've mentioned, I've mentioned this before, before but it's certainly but it's true, true, true thinking, thinking about, about Jesus', Jesus ministry. ministry. If I, if if I, I, if use, I the use the word teach, teach in, in our minds, minds, we think a lot different event going, going on, on then if I, if I, I tell, tell you, you I'm getting I'm ready, getting to, ready preach. to preach, I'm getting ready, getting ready to teach, teach, or I'm getting I'm ready, ready to preach. preach. Now, in our, in minds, our minds, we see we those as two completely, completely different, different events. events. Okay? Okay. Okay. And if and I were to ask you, what's, what's the difference between teaching and preaching? preaching. And you might have you to might think a moment and say, well, preaching happens when the preacher's up behind the pulpit. Okay. Okay. Uh, can, uh, I can I preach if I'm standing down here? Down here? You know, so we start, we start, if you start, start asking, asking these kind of questions, questions you realize after a while, a while there is going to be some overlap, overlap between, between teaching, teaching and, preaching. and preaching. But in our mind, we kind of separate, separate the two. The two. There, have there have been some, some New Testament, Testament scholars try to um, make clear make distinctions distinction between the two, and I'm still not convinced, although I do see a couple of generalities. Teaching and instructing tends to have more ethical kind of guidelines for living. 
Whereas in the New Testament, when you look a lot of times about preaching, preaching is specifically, many, many times, connected to the general idea of proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. So those, those go together real well. And then the teaching is more of instruction, and we would often think in terms of like ethics. Uh, and that's not a hard and fast rule, but it is pretty general. In fact, in the New Testament, the idea of teaching comes up 97 times. So you could have a really rich, in-depth study of what that means in the New Testament. Of course, we don't have time to do that. But just so you know that it is a significant topic in the New Testament. Okay? Uh, turn to Matthew 22, verse 16. Uh, this is uh, well, verse 15. When the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap Jesus in his words, they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. That's an interesting thing that we'll look at later when we get to that point. Uh, both the Pharisees and Herodians cooperating together, which you normally never saw that. But they said, Teacher, we know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. And then they said, tell us then what's your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Of course, they think they've set him up with the horns of a dilemma here. But the interesting thing is their admission of who they believe Jesus is as teacher. And in some ways, they've really nailed it. Notice, first of all, how they define a teacher. We know that you're a man of integrity. Okay, so, and you may have heard of the traditional uh, three-part approach to, uh, to rhetoric and speaking. And certainly, if you think of this way, and I think it was uh, Aristotle that was uh, famous for this in his work on, on rhetoric, but you've got uh, the ethos, which is the ethics of the person. Uh, when someone is speaking... You don't want their life and their reputation to cancel out their message, okay? Then there's the uh, logos, which is the word, the message. And, you, you know, it's understood that if you're going to speak, you need to know what you're talking about. And then the third, of course, would be the pathos or the passion or the, uh, the motivation uh, for why you're saying what you're saying. And certainly Jesus has all three of those. They recognize that you're a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. So, so notice those two things. They bring those together in their recognition of Jesus as teacher, a man of integrity. And he really knows what he's talking about because what he says is according to the word of truth. So I thought that's a significant insight into how even the Pharisees saw Jesus functioning as teacher. Now, when we think about preaching... Again, uh, the preaching of the good news, uh, 61 times in the New Testament. So it also is a very significant concept in the New Testament. Uh, we've already seen, if you look back in chapter 4 of Matthew, we've already come across this idea of Jesus preaching earlier. 417, from that time on Jesus began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. See, and notice again that how closely associated preaching is with the kingdom of God and the good news. Um, we saw it in chap back in chapter 10, the chapter we just finished, chapter 10, verse 7, when he sends them out to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim this message, or preach this message, the kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead. Cleanse those who have leprosy. Drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. So again, the proclamation is the good news. And it's the good news of the kingdom of God breaking into human affairs with a, with a potential for new life like they had never envisioned. And that's the proclamation. Look at Matthew 24, 14.
this is where Jesus is responding to his disciples about the destruction of the temple, the sign of the end of times. He says, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So not only do you have the universal proclamation of the gospel, but it is the gospel or the good news of the kingdom being preached and proclaimed. And then one more, look at 26, 13. And this is the little episode where Jesus is anointed um, by a woman and the disciples, of course, they're upset because she's wasted this expensive perfume. And Jesus was aware of that. So he, he uses this moment for a teaching moment. And he says, why are you bothering this woman? She's done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you'll always have with you, but you'll not always have me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. And that is just this little episode. And we still know about it today because Matthew recorded it. And Jesus said, wherever the gospel is going to be preached, uh, this episode will come up. Really? Well, think about it. And, and, of course, a lot of great lessons will come to this when we get to chapter 26. But what she had, she used to anoint Jesus. Now, you think this is amazing because you know good and well she didn't have, she had no knowledge of the full sweep of God's plan being fulfilled in Jesus, both with death, burial, and resurrection and you know, post-resurrection appearances and all that that Matthew's going to talk about later. She had no knowledge of that, but she just knew that whatever she had, the most expensive thing she had, she needed to anoint Jesus, worship him, and, and do whatever she could to respond to it. And, and of course, Jesus, you know, he's amazed by this. Instead, of, and <laughs> again, we've already seen this in, in Matthew. Instead of the disciples being the ones that would act with such faith, it's somebody else. Uh, this and this, you know, we've seen this, what was it, five times in Matthew, Jesus actually says to his disciples, oh, you have little faith. Well, this, this occasion right here in Matthew 26, had Jesus said, oh, you have little faith, that wouldn't have surprised me because it's another one of those settings, you know. And here's this woman anointing Jesus. She's the one that has the kind of faith Jesus is looking for. But isn't it interesting that uh, this is a message here of the gospel, the good news being proclaimed and preached. Now back to uh, chapter 11. He says, I want you to go back and report to John what you see and hear. Because John is in prison. And John has heard about some of these deeds of Jesus, the Messiah. And so he sent his disciples because John wants to know, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? So John's curious. He doesn't know the answer to that. So he sends out his disciples so they can get the you know, information firsthand and bring it back to John. And what this does, it leads us into Jesus' understanding of his own ministry as he shares it with John's disciples. He says, I want you to go back and report to John what you see and hear. And notice, uh, this is almost um, a repetition of what we have seen Jesus say earlier. Remember back in chapter 10 where he's sending his disciples out. That I want you to heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out the demons. Well, notice here he says... The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the good news is proclaimed to the poor. And so we find all of these things, uh, let's see, what is that? It's one, two, three, four, five, six different things are identified here as uh, sort of shaping the ministry of Jesus. 
And it's interesting because when you go back through the Gospel of Matthew, uh, you can see incidents where these occur, okay? And Jesus wants John's disciples to know that, this, that he is the one. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Now let's think about that for just a moment. Remember we talked about earlier when we read the Gospels, we're reading at three levels at once. You're reading it on the historical level of Jesus' time. We're also reading it in Matthew's time. He's recording the story 30 years later for the church of his day. And then, of course, we read it on our level. And we ask the question, okay, uh, this happened. Matthew wrote about it. What does it mean for us today? I mean, we constantly ask that. And that's a good question. But I want you to think about on the first two levels, where Jesus is saying to John's disciples, you go back and tell him, yeah, I'm the one that's expected. I am the Messiah, but I don't want anyone to stumble. You're blessed if you don't stumble because of me. Well, there was a lot of stumbling by people in Jesus' day. Uh, he didn't match their expectations for the Messiah. Uh, in the Gospel of John, uh, there's that sad verse where it says, Many, many of them, when they found out what Jesus was about, they turned and walked away. And I've often wondered, how many times during his ministry were there sort of these straggling disciples that kind of hung around him, but they, they, they would keep getting frustrated because he wasn't fulfilling their agenda. And so Jesus would look up and on certain days, so-and-so's gone. Next day, maybe somebody else has left. So I, I get the impression this may have been kind of an ongoing dynamic. People were curious, but when Jesus didn't match what they were expecting, they just got up and left. And so Jesus says here to his disciples, um, you know, blessed are you if you don't stumble because of me. Now think about it during Matthew's day. And, and we don't know, let's assume Matthew was written before the fall of Jerusalem. But for Christians in the larger Palestinian area, and as the church was sort of growing outward from that, uh, there were a lot of opportunities for Christians to face persecution and to stumble because of who Jesus was portrayed. Um, think about this. And you probably know this from history. Uh, in AD 64, when Nero burned, it seemed like half of Rome, uh, and historians now believe that he, he really did that on purpose because um, there were certain parts of Rome that don't fit the romantic picture of the big Roman columns, you know, Corinthian columns and big white marble buildings and all this really neat stuff that you think about with ancient Rome. It's pretty a lot of slum. Um, there is a reference book on. It's called, it's by Jose Carcapino, and the name of the book is called Daily Life in Ancient Rome. It, it's it's an amazing resource. But you don't read it like you read a novel. It's more of a reference book, but it's about yay thick. And he's gone through all the ancient resources to help you really see what ancient Rome was like. One of the things that really intrigued me, and, and you see why Nero got so upset about parts of the city, for a while there were no building codes in Rome. And Carcapino uh, accesses some of the sources and says that a very common occurrence was in the middle of the night you would hear buildings collapse because they would try to build them as high as they could, but they didn't have good building codes. And uh, there were parts of the city that were just as slum as could be. And Nero decided, okay, enough's enough. And so apparently, you know, he, um, what's that old expression? Nero's fiddling while Rome burns? You've heard that expression. Well, it's because Nero was behind the fire. He wanted it to burn. But, in order to divert attention away from himself, guess who gets blamed in Rome for the fire? The Christians do. And so as a result, the Christians, at least in that immediate area, get the tag put on them as arsonists. Now can you imagine trying to be a Christian, <laughs> and if you claim to be one, somebody would say, Oh, okay, so you're, in that, you're, the, you're part of the group of those arsonists that started the fire in Rome. And that wasn't the only thing. Um, 
think about other labels that Christians got. Uh, so in some places, Christians were labeled cannibals. Now, it doesn't take you long to figure out why that was. Can you imagine somebody who wasn't a Christian sitting in on an assembly and they're getting ready to take the Lord's Supper and somebody reads from one of the Gospels where Jesus says, take, eat my flesh. You know, this is my body. Uh, this is my blood. Drink you all of it. <laughs> I mean, it wouldn't take much for an uninitiated person to hear that language and think, my, so that's who these people are. And then, of course, the rumor gets out. So there were lots of reasons why in Matthew's day, Christians could stumble. People who might otherwise have wanted to hear the gospel, the good news, would stumble at trying to embrace this Christian message. Well, today's a little different, at least in America. Uh, but think of how people today stumble because of the message of Jesus. Probably at the top of the list, you might have what you might think would be your list, but I think at the top of the list, at least way up there, is the exclusive claims of Jesus. A lot of people in our culture stumble at that. Uh, if you're a Christian and you believe salvation is only through Jesus, well, uh, you're not as tolerant as you need to be. And I think that's probably, you know, that's really high up there today. And there are a lot of people who stumble at the message of Jesus today. Because, and I've had some people tell me this. They will not embrace the Christian faith because they believe that it is too exclusive. Well, my only response to that is, Jesus claims he died for me and that's good enough for me. You know? <laughs> I don't know, I don't hear anybody else telling me they died for me. So if he died for me, he's got my exclusive claim. Uh, but there are a lot of people that, that don't want to go with that. And, and you might think of other reasons why people today in our culture stumble at who the Messiah is. Uh, he doesn't match a lot of people's preconceived notions of, of what Jesus ought to be. So anyway, well, I could have a whole lesson on that. But he wants you to go back and tell John and then to be aware, blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Now, Jesus then begins to speak about John. And I love these rhetorical questions. Um, think about this. What did you go out in the wilderness to see? A reed swayed by the wind? <laughs> now think about that image. There's going to be some imagery here he's going to be. What did you go out in the wilderness to see? Wind blowing around? A, wheat, you know, a reed swayed by the wind? That's all? You know, what... There's nothing out there. Why'd you go out there? Okay, then he, then he continues. If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? Eh, you don't normally go out in the wilderness to see someone dressed in fine clothes. But he said, no, because those who wear fine clothes are in the king's palaces. So you didn't you see, and it's kind of interesting because in an, in an ancient way of argumentation, he's eliminating possibilities. So, so nothing out there, fine clothes, people wear it, no. Then would you go out to see a prophet? See, he's getting closer. But you know, John's more than a prophet. Uh, and there are people that did look at John as a prophet. But here's a quote. Uh, from Malachi 3.1, I'll send my messenger ahead of you and prepare your way before you. And I think, let me double check. Look over in Mark chapter 1 because as Mark begins his gospel, picture of Jesus, uh, yeah, notice uh, he's going to quote also from Malachi 3.1, but he has a little bit more extensive quote, Mark does. Mark chapter 1, the beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, well, he pulls together Isaiah and also Malachi. I'll send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John is viewed as uh, preparing the way for Jesus. And he says, I truly tell you that 
Among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Now, Jesus is going to do something here that's interesting. No one greater than John. But, notice this. Whoever is the least in the kingdom is greater than John. You're going, huh? He's not making any sense here. Well, think about what he's doing. On the one hand, John is greater than anyone else. And I think what Jesus is hinting here is at the role in which John is willing to play. John doesn't get the headlines. Uh, but John is just trying to prepare people for Jesus and his ministry and his message. And, of course, he pays with it for his life. Uh, but in addition to that, uh, whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John. And why is that? Because they will actually be in the kingdom... John, John's not going to get the privilege of being in the kingdom. And even the least in the kingdom is going to have immediate blessings that John didn't get to have. So on the one hand, he is the greater. But on the other hand, he's the least because he's not going to get the privilege of some of those blessings. And he says, from the day of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been subjected to violence. And violent people have... Um, what been rating it. This is a difficult verse. Number one, depending on which English translation that you pick up, it's going to be translated different. And this one's for me. You, you, <laughs> you, you obviously can't see the words, but I, I printed out so I could see it. Uh, let's see, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There are uh, 11 different English translations, and they're not all worded the same way. And it ranges from uh, the New American Standard Bible goes from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and violent men take it by force. Uh, and then the one that's probably a good opposite of it, from the time of John the baptizer till now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing, and forceful people have been seizing it. Uh, and there's a lot of question on what does that verse really mean. And I think here's probably be the best explanation. That the idea is that from the time when John began preaching, men of violence were trying to force their way into the kingdom. Or, uh, and this, this is a, a quote I took from one writer. Uh, I would even say it even a little bit different in the sense that they were trying to force the kingdom into their way of thinking. It's almost as if they knew what the kingdom needed to look like, so they were trying to force it into their mold. And it's compared to a walled city that men try to storm and enter. And they tried a little later, you remember, see this in Matthew, they tried a little later to make him king. They're trying to force Jesus to be king. So... I think the point here is it's the recognition, and we talked about this earlier about Matthew, the recognition that there are a whole lot of people who think they know what Jesus ought to be doing. <laughs> and as a result of that, um, they, they think that he ought to fit their criteria for Messiah. They also think they understand pretty clearly what the kingdom needs to look like. And so they're marshalling all of their forces and all of their energy to try and force the kingdom to be to their liking. And, Jesus, and it's no wonder then that Jesus says, blessed are you if you don't stumble because of me. A lot of people did in the first century because they had different ideas of what they thought Jesus ought to be doing. Oh, okay. Um, and then 16 through 19, this is an interesting little message here because he's going to talk about what is this generation like? Well, it's like children sitting in the marketplace. And Jesus says, what shall I compare them to? Christ uh, proceeds to reprove the inconsistency and the fickleness of that age of people. Uh, he says they were like children. Nothing pleased them. He refers here to the plays or the sports of children. They would be sitting there and they'd be asking different people to do different things as they went by. And so it's like children sitting in the marketplace. Fickle, inconsistent. Uh, really wasn't committed to much. Um, it, it's a pretty biting criticism <laughs> of the people in the of Jesus' day and time that he's having to deal with. Here's the fascinating, when I read that verse, 
and, and I read this section here. It amazes me that Jesus was still willing to give his heart and soul to the lives of people who so misunderstood him. Uh, and, and I guess I get more and more uh, intrigued by that as we go through Matthew. That even his disciples still didn't understand what he was about. Those around him had different ideas of what he ought to be about. Uh, he saw them as sheep without shepherd. He saw them very fickle, very inconsistent, following him for the wrong motivations. But in spite of all of that, Jesus didn't give up on people. And I think part of the good news that's, that's really foundational, and we see it all through Matthew, is through Jesus, God does not give up on people. I really, and that is good news. And I think all of us sitting here this morning can say, that's certainly good news in my life, that I know God didn't give up on me. Because there were times when I wanted to give up on me. Maybe there's times when people in my life have given up on me. God's not going to give up on me. And that's part of the good news. And we need to recognize that that's one of the foundational pillars of Jesus' ministry. Well, we'll begin there uh, next week at chapter 11, verse 20. Thank you all for being here this morning.